Welcome back to Act on Mental Health, where we're learning the ins and outs of acceptance and commitment therapy, or as it's known, ACT. We also talk about relational frame theory on this channel, which is all about how language can create the suffering that we have and how we can relate differently with the mind's chatter. Now today, we're going to be looking at what a typical first session looks like with an ACT therapist. Now I'll say at the outset that while ACT has protocols for specific mental health diagnoses, it is a process-based therapy, which means that a therapist will often jump around the six core processes depending on the presenting problem. The purpose of this channel is to make ACT accessible, easier to grasp, and something that you can use in your own life as well as in your counseling practice. So whether you're going to a therapist who's using ACT and you're wondering what acceptance and commitment therapy is all about, or whether you're in graduate school wondering if ACT is for you, or if you're a counselor in your practice and you're trying to utilize ACT, this channel is for you. Now, early on in my practice of ACT, I read from a script some of the metaphors and exercises that I'll share with you. Now I do it more naturally off the cuff, and I don't really rely on a script. But I'll include the manual for depression in the description below so that you can read for yourself what this script looks like and then adapt it for yourself. One word of caution is that while getting the metaphor right is important, the emphasis should be on getting engagement right. So look at the metaphor and exercises as role-playing experiential therapy. These are done with the client, not to the client. And that goes for workbooks that you might be doing on your own. ACT is designed to be experienced for yourself. So avoid intellectualizing or preaching the points. Just use the metaphors as a way to experience something you're trying to teach. Now, with that out of the way, what can you expect when you come for your first session with an ACT therapist? In this video, I'll break down the four parts of a session that work with most clients. For this video, we'll focus on anxiety and depressive symptoms, even though it works with a variety of mental health conditions. Now, let's get started with our test clients, Larry and Linda. In most counseling settings, your first appointment will actually be an intake. This intake will gather several categories of information to help your counselor to have a better understanding of the context of your presenting problem. This is where the therapist will go over the informed consent, confidentiality, and the limits of confidentiality. They'll go over their credentials and introduce the therapy approach or approaches that they use. The second appointment is actually session one of therapy. Larry has come to counseling because he has some problems in his relationship with his wife of 10 years. They have two children and a lot of stress in their life. Now, his wife encouraged him to seek counseling after a recent DUI and the suspension of his license. Larry reports that he really doesn't enjoy anything anymore. And he doesn't drink very often, but when he does, he can't seem to stop. Larry reports that he's experienced what appears to be a mild depression over the last two years. Larry also reports daily use of cannabis. The therapist assesses Larry's case and provides him with the following diagnosis persistent depressive disorder, and cannabis use disorder, mild in severity. Now, Linda is in nursing school, and she is seeking therapy to address chronic worry, difficulty concentrating, and ambivalence about continuing or quitting school. Linda reports recently ending a three-year relationship with her partner a few months ago, and she lives with her parents with no children. Linda reports financial debts from school loans, credit card bills, and a car payment. The therapist assesses Linda and provides a preliminary diagnosis of adjustment disorder with anxiety. The therapist has not ruled out the possibility of Linda having generalized anxiety disorder, but since the symptoms started when the relationship ended, adjustment disorder appears more fitting. In the first part of session one, I usually discuss the presenting problem and preliminary diagnoses. This helps to know what we're working on, but it isn't something that we're going to focus on or harp on. I want to know if the diagnosis fits Larry and Linda's experience, and then try to understand what's going on for him and her, and what's a problem right now. Once Larry, Linda, and I have a clear picture of the problem, then we're ready for the next part of the session. Now, I might use a transition statement like this. Larry, Linda, sounds like you want things to be different than they are right now. Do I have that right? Well, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on for you by listing what you've tried so far. In my office, I have a whiteboard that I use for this part of the exercise so that the client can see for themselves the things that they've tried, the things that have worked, the things that have not worked. Now, 
if you're doing this with an with a client and you don't have a whiteboard, you can use a piece of paper and just make a list of things that they've tried and things that have worked and things that have not worked. If you're at home and you're planning on going to an ACT therapist, you can do this at home and just write down the things that you've tried. I'll provide some samples here for you to see what this would look like for Larry and for Linda. As you can see, Larry's tried several things, smoking weed, drinking beer, playing video games, sleeping a lot, staying at home, energy drinks, pornography, hanging out with friends, trying to be positive, play with children, and watching movies with his wife. Linda, she's also tried a variety of activities, studying, planning my week, to-do lists, staying active, treating myself, shopping, go to church, hang out with parents, go out with friends, routines, and reading. Once the list has been created, it's helpful to star the activities that appear to work the best for the client. For Larry, it's smoking weed, video games, and energy drinks that seem to work the best. For Linda, it's staying active, shopping, and routines that seem to work the best. This is where we can now look at the short-term benefits versus the long-term cost. For each one, have the client list the benefits first, then the cost. For example, Larry may list the benefits of smoking weed is that he feels relaxed and can sleep better, and the costs are dissatisfaction with his life without weed. For Linda, it's shopping that may provide that short-term benefit of something new, but long-term costs of credit card bills loom. Sometimes a client may have trouble with this part of the exercise and may even believe that there's no long-term costs that appear. So I may say, it sounds like this works really well for you. Does it work in every situation? Tell me more about that. Why didn't it work there? Or I may be more direct. It sounds like the benefits are clear, but the costs are less clear. And I suppose if this works for you, you wouldn't be here in front of me in therapy. Obviously, this isn't how you should start this exercise, but if Larry or Linda just can't seem to figure out that there's a problem with what they've tried, then there are more blunt routes that may be warranted so they can confront their own blindness to their problem. After all, if this was working for them, they wouldn't be here. The conclusion should be that they've tried everything they know, and some work well in the short term, but have a long-term cost attached. And I might say this, as you see, you've tried a lot to address this problem, and some work well in some situations, but not all, and some better than others. Perhaps you're ready to try something else, a new way to address your problem. Once you've got your list, they're able to see the benefits and costs then you're ready for the first metaphor in ACT. To set this up, I let them know that this is going to be difficult to understand, and the design of this metaphor is not to understand it in entirety, but to learn an important lesson through a story. And so I may set this up different. I don't really read this per verbatim, but for you, I'm going to read it verbatim, and I'm going to kind of allow the the scenery of the footage that I'm showing you to kind of set the scene. But I want you to think about how you can make this story your own and how it might fit in a therapy session if you're utilizing this. Imagine that you're blindfolded, given a little bag of tools to carry, and placed in a field. You're told that your job is to live your life by moving around this field while blindfolded. So you start moving around in the field, and sooner or later, you fall into this big hole. Now, one tendency you might have would be to look to your history to figure out how you got into this hole, exactly what path you followed to end up there. You might tell yourself, I went to the left and over a hill and then to the right, and then I fell in. In one sense, that may be true. You are in this particular hole because you walked exactly that way. However, knowing that is not the solution of knowing how to get out of the hole. Furthermore, even if you had not done exactly that, and you had taken another direction instead, in this metaphor, you might have fallen into another hole anyway. Because unbeknownst to you, in this field, there are countless, widely spaced, fairly deep holes. So if it weren't this particular hole, it would have been another one. Anyway, so now that you're in the hole, blindfolded, what you might do in such a predicament is to take the bag of tools you've been given and use them to try to get out of the hole. Now just suppose that all the tools you've been given are shovels. So you dutifully start digging with the shovel, but can you dig your way out of a hole? Shovels are very useful for creating holes, but not for getting us out of them. So maybe you tried to dig faster, or with bigger shovelfuls, or with a different style. More, better, and different. More, 
better and different. But all of that makes no difference, because digging is not the way out of the hole. It only makes the hole bigger. Pretty soon, this hole is huge. It has multiple rooms, halls, and caverns. It is more and more elaborate. So maybe you stop for a while and try to put up with it, but it doesn't work. You are still in the depression hole. Isn't this like what has happened with your depression? It's become bigger and bigger to now where it's a major focus of your life. You know all of this hasn't worked, and what I'm saying is that it can't work. Don't believe me? Look at your own experience. You absolutely can't dig your way out of the hole. It's like a rigged game. It's hopeless. That's not to say that there may not be a way out, but within the system you have been working with, digging as your agenda, no matter how much motivation you have or how hard you dig, there is no way out. This is not a trick. No fooling. You know that sense that you have when you're stuck and that you came here to help fix it? Well, you are stuck. And in the system in which you have been working with, digging as the agenda, there is no way out. The things you've been taught to do aren't working, although they may work perfectly well somewhere else. The problem is not the tool. It's the situation in which you find yourself using it. So perhaps you came in here wanting a gold-plated steam shovel for me. Well, I can't give it to you. But even if I could, I wouldn't because that's not going to solve your problem. It'd only make it worse. Now, if they ask for the way out of the hole, you can say something like, your job right now is not to figure out how to get out of the hole. That's what you've been doing all along. Your job is to accept that you are in one. In the position you are in right now, even if it, you were given other things to do, it wouldn't be helpful. The problem is not the tool, it's the agenda of digging. Even if you were given a ladder right now, it wouldn't do you any good. You'd only try to dig with it. And ladders make terrible shovels. You can't do anything productive until you let go of the shovel and let go of digging as the agenda. You need to make room for something else in your hands. And that is very difficult and bold thing to do. The shovel appears to be the only tool that you have, and letting go of it looks as though it will doom you to stay in the hole forever. Have you suffered enough? Are you ready to give up and do something else? So at this point, evaluate how they react to the metaphor, emphasizing that it's not their fault that they're in the tough spot that they're in. What matters is that each person can make choices and take action. They are capable of responding to their situation. In other words, everybody has an ability to respond a responsibility. Everyone does the best they can with the tools that they have at the moment. And without this ability to choose and act, there's no chance for change. Now, when discussing the metaphor, when someone isn't understanding it, you might say, don't take my word at face value. and Don't be surprised if this discussion leaves you feeling a bit confused. Feeling confused is normal and a part of breaking away from the cycle that keeps you feeling stuck. If you think you fully understand what we're doing right now and what I'm saying, you might need to think it over a bit more. This metaphor is difficult for me because part of my gift and curse is that I want everyone to get it and make the teaching easy to understand and try to be helpful. And so when a client is struggling with creative hopelessness, I have to remind myself that their struggle, at least in this context, is helping them to learn valuable lessons. Now, I did have one client who struggled with this and didn't return to the counseling clinic. And so just as a warning, there may be dropouts. They may occur with this. And with, while that's their decision, it's also a potential risk for this type of therapy that we do enact. So the final part of session one is discussing the problem of control and what we can do about it. Control for Larry may be substances, experiences, or relationships. Control for Linda may be rigid routines, spending experiences, or planning. While control is understandable, it is core to the maintenance of their problem. Through listing what's worked and what's not worked, and role-playing a metaphor like digging a hole, Larry and Linda can readily see how controlling their experiences hasn't gotten them out of their depression or anxiety hole. And coming to therapy and to a therapist, they have an expectation that you will either help them out of the hole that they're in or will give them a golden shovel to help them out. This is where you land the session with the goal of doing nothing different at this time. Now, if control is the problem, then doing something else isn't the solution. 
The solution has something to do with willingness to have the experience and acceptance of particular hole that they found themselves in and letting go of their shovel or whatever form they have of controlling and digging. Now, we're not going to leave them hanging here. What I like to do is to encourage them to do nothing different until next session. Just notice their experience. Notice what comes up for them. Notice what it's like to be here and now. And notice what is happening when they engage in the things that work in the short term, but at the cost of the long term. A simple activity that can help them to experientially learn to notice is to drink mindfully. This is something I either prepare in advance by bringing them a cup of water, myself a cup of water, or I utilize whatever they may have brought with them to drink. If there's nothing available, I have an alternative exercise that I'll show you in a moment. Have them hold their cup in their hand and notice the sensations of their hand holding the cup. Next, have them bring the cup to touch their lips and notice the sensations of the lips contacting the cup and then the anticipatory sensations in the mouth awaiting the cool water. Next, have them drink and hold the contents in their mouth and notice the sensations of their tongue, mouth, and throat. Then have them swallow the liquid and notice any relief sensations. Some may swallow automatically, so have them notice that sensation as well. Debrief the experience and say, do you think you could do that this week? Just notice your experience. Alternatively, you can do this 54321 awareness exercise. So first, have them close their eyes and notice their breathing. So the sensations of their nose and mouth as the air comes in and comes out. And then their lungs filling and releasing air. Next, have them open their eyes and call out five things that they notice in the room. Next, have them listen for four things that they can hear. And it may take them a moment to be able to get up to four. Next, have them touch three things in the room, and they can get up if they wish to. Next, have them smell two things near them, and then end with one thing that they can taste. If they can't find something near them, like their shirt or pen, have them lick their lips. Debrief the experience and say, do you think you could do that this week? Just notice your experience. And that's what you can expect with your first session with an ACT therapist. Now that's it for this video. If you found this video valuable, go ahead and like, comment, and share. It really helps this content to spread and reach those that are out there that want to learn ACT. If you want to see more content like this, consider becoming a subscriber. It really means a lot to me, and I'm glad that I can do this every Sunday at noon and put this content out to you. Remember, your journey towards a more purposeful and mindful life begins with a single click.